not in the least part on this wonderful song coming up right now. A song which a few years ago was a top notch in America, and the Platters knew it was the one that we were It's on its way up there again. The Platters sing. Thank you. Awesome. 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 for bringing the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to Cleveland and inducting, along with late disc jockey Scott Mooney, Ellen Free, into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1986. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Mr. Music himself, Norm N. Knight. Thank you so much, Chris Mitchell. And uh, you can all gather around and we get as close as you possibly can. Uh, ladies and gentlemen and true lovers of uh, rock and roll, Freed family, honored guests, welcome to this very special tribute. The words rock and roll have been bantered around by the followers of pop music for over 60 years. But what has this expression come to mean by the youth of the world who have supported this music all this time? For the millions of teenage supporters from the decade of the 50s up until today, it has become a personal statement of their feelings frustrations, dreams, and attitudes towards society, and the difficulties trying to survive in a world that the only people that are able to understand their pains are the people their own age. The music and the beat of rock and roll was the unifying thread that held them together as a group for these past seven decades. At the source of this music was one man who popularized the expression rock and roll in the early 50s. He brought it to the mainstream of public acceptance, and today, it has become a billion dollar a year industry. Alan Freed and rock and roll are synonymous for he was his creator and his driving force during his birth and development in the 50s. Who was Alan Freed? Ask the hundreds of artists like Chuck Berry, Fats Domino, Little Richard, Little Anthony and Jimmy Clanton, whose careers he helped launch who he was. Ask the thousands of fans who listened to his radio shows both in Cleveland and New York saw his movies and who stood in line at the Brooklyn Paramount and Fox Theaters in New York for his holiday stage shows who he was. Ask disc jockeys, newscasters, program directors, and other media people who Alan Freed was. They will all say in one voice, he was the father of rock and roll, the man who started it all. Alan Freed to a teenager of the 50s created a world of unbearable sexuality and celebration a world of citizens in their teens in a constant stage of joy or sweet sorrow. He was a teenager's mind funneled into 50,000 watts. Listening to him was like having an aisle seat at World War II. <laughs> Alan Freed in just a few short years changed the course of popular music, the repercussions of which are still being felt today. His life was one of ascension from poverty to the heights of financial success only to be cut down by misfortune, leading to the depths of despair and become a lonely man. His life was a sad story of a man who experienced every emotion from feeling sadness to joy, to have power and wealth and millions of fans, but in the end, lost it all and became sadly forgotten. The Freed family lived with this since his passing on January 20th, 1965, until final redemption, when the Hall of Fame chose to induct him that very first year January 23rd, 1986, and I, along with the late disc jockey, Scott Muni, had the honor of inducting Allen into the Hall of Fame, and rightly so. Today is a celebration of his life and bringing him home to Cleveland, where it all began 
with his permanent internment. And to Alan's son Lance and the rest of the Freed family, thank you for this opportunity to honor a man who happened to be a disc jockey who put into motion a force known as rock and roll and changed our culture forever. We begin our afternoon tribute with the Drifters. Now the Drifters, who were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1988 by Billy Joel, have a rich musical heritage that goes back to their debut with their first hit in October of 1953, Money Honey. They have had some great lead singers like Clyde McFadder, Johnny Moore, Bobby Hendricks, Betty King, Charlie Thomas, and Rudy Lewis, giving us such hits as Honey Love, White Christmas, Ruby Baby, There Goes My Baby, Dance With Me, Save the Last Dance For Me, Up On The Roof, On Broadway, Under The Boardwalk, just to name a few. 40 charted singles. And here today, keeping the music and the sound of the Drifters alive, are Earl Clover, Jerome Jackson, Eric Turner, and A.J. Davis, and Gary Cupper, musical director at the keyboards. They're going to be doing a song written by Hall of Famer Doc Pomus and Mort Schumann in 1960 with This Magic Moment. today for this celebration and we do hope that you enjoy our singing today.
Let's hear for the Drifters, and they'll be back in just a short while. At this time, I'd like to uh, introduce Kathy Goss, the president of CEO of uh, Lakeview Cemetery Association, and she has a few words to say. Kathy? Hi, everyone. Welcome to Lakeview Cemetery. That's kind of a hard act to follow. We don't do this every day, but if I may, I'd like to take you back to the beginning of Lakeview Cemetery. I welcome you, and I'm so glad to be part of this freed celebration. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy Goss. Thank you. We have in the audience a lot of interesting people, dignitaries, people from uh, rock and roll and what have you. I would like to recognize the fact that in the audience we have Rick Davies and his wife Sue. And uh, Rick is here as the founder of the band Super Tramp, which has sold in excess of 60 million albums worldwide. Tom Mandel, owner of WAKR, an affiliate radio station of Akron. WAKR was the first major station where Alan Freed worked. And Ed Esposito, Executive Vice President, General Manager of WAKR and WONE, for their support of Alan Freed in this event. We also have two proclamations. The first one is from Governor John Kasich. And it says, Alan Freed, the father of rock and roll, on behalf of the state of Ohio, we join all those gathered in celebrating the life of Alan Freed and the unveiling of the Alan Freed Monument. Known as the father of rock and roll, Alan Freed's impact on music not only created a new genre, but played a pivotal role in the fight against segregation. This public monument is a fitting tribute to Alan Freed's legacy of courage and contributions he made to music, and we are honored to join his friends, family, and community in remembering a remarkable man. That's Governor John Kasich. And also, we have a, a proclamation from the mayor of uh, Cleveland, Office of Mayor Frank Jackson. I'll just read a part of it. On behalf of the citizens of Cleveland, I am honored to offer this proclamation designed May 7th, 2016, as Alan Freed Day in our great city. Alan Freed coined the term rock and roll in 1952 and setting forth in motion a new kind of music from the blues, R&B, jazz, and country. So uh, we have two wonderful, wonderful proclamations. Now, this, this next one's gonna be a lot of fun for me. I have known and have now the honor of introducing a man I've known for over 30 years, Stephen Van Zandt. A man who in 1974, along with Johnny Lyon, formed Southside Johnny and the Asbury Jukes. A year later, Stephen joined the E Street Band with Bruce Springsteen. In the mid-80s, made great albums including the Sun City, City Trilogy, which drew worldwide attention to the appalling conditions of apartheid in South Africa. In 1992, for the movie Home Alone 2, wrote for Darlene Love, the Christmas classic, Nobody Wants to Be Alone on Christmas. Stephen is an American musician, songwriter, arranger, record producer, actor, and radio personality. Stephen has been known by many names over the years. <laughs> Little Stephen and the Disciples of Soul, Miami Steve, playing Silvio Dante on the hit HBO show, The Sopranos, and created the very first Netflix show, Lily Hammer, which ran for three seasons and encouraged the network to add stream programming as a major component to its television model. His radio programs on Sirius XM and Terrestrial Radio, Little Steven's Underground Garage, is syndicated around the world, and he has created an amazing foundation called Rock and Roll Forever, raising over $1 million this year alone to make music education available to young musicians and school programs. A legendary figure of rock and roll, a man who loves the roots and all facets of rock and roll, a true historian, ladies and gentlemen, our keynote speaker, Stephen Van Zandt. Damn, Norm. <laughs> Making me tired. Got my little mini teleprompter here, which of course I cannot read, so. Hold on a minute. It's so great you all came out today. It's a special day. First of all, uh, I am honored to be here today. Uh, I am honored to call Lance Freed one of my best friends. Uh, and honored that he asked me to participate in this sacred ceremony 
And for those of us whose religion is rock and roll, I do mean sacred. Aldon James Allen Freed, born December 15, 1921 in Winburg, Pennsylvania. Grew up in Salem, Ohio, where he played trombone in a band he called the Sultans of Swing. I'm gonna do a little brief bullet point history and then I wanna just say a few words. Uh, 1942, Starts at WKST, Newcastle, Pennsylvania, on the radio. Goes to Youngstown, WKBN, 43. 1945, WAKR in Akron. Uh, 1950, has a brief experience with TV, but that brings him back to Cleveland, where he hooks up with Leo Mintz. And uh, that's a very important marriage, as you know. It is uh, Leo's... Uh, Record Rendezvous store that will that will sponsor Alan as he begins his historic run on WJW uh, July 11th, 1951. He uses the Moon Dog Symphony as a theme and temporarily becomes the Moon Dog. Uh, in 1952, March 13th is the day rock and roll became a game changer. Uh, it is the day the industry really began as an industry something called the Moondog Coronation Ball, right here at Cleveland Arena, the very first rock and roll show. Yeah, for real. Uh, 1953, he gets in a very bad car accident and is given 10 years to live, which he beat by about two years. Uh, that first rock and roll, uh, live performance, that first show, would lead to the first rock and roll tour, the biggest R&B show. And that is a tradition that is continuing to this day, keeping rock and roll alive. As you know, that first tour was Ruth Brown, Winoni Harris, The Clovers, Joe Lewis and his band, uh, The Fighter, uh, Lester Young, and Buddy Johnson. They went from uh, Revere, Massachusetts to New Orleans for a month playing every day, and that really began that tradition of rock and roll tours. Um, they'd run a tape of, of, of the Cleveland show on a Newark, New Jersey station, WNJR, which would bring them to New York, 1954, WINS, where, we'd, where he would make his biggest impact. Uh, you all know the movies, the rock and roll movies uh, in the late 50s. And in 1957, the very first uh, national rock and roll TV show. Yes, before American Bandstand. And uh, it was going great up until Frankie Lyman jumping off the stage and dancing with a white girl. Uh, shows you the state of our uh, segregation at that time. All that stuff you can look up. But here's the thing. What's important to understand, I think, is that rock and roll was not inevitable. And black music in general, crossing over to the white world in a very segregated society, was not inevitable. Um, let's see if I can try and explain it this way. Our ability as a species to adapt is one of our strongest characteristics. And when bad things happen, we adjust. Difficult circumstances, we, we adapt. But adjusting so readily can be a bad thing in one sense. When something good happens, we adapt to that also and almost immediately take it for granted. Uh, suddenly, history becomes inevitable. Well, I don't believe in inevitability when it comes to history and not when it comes to greatness. And Alan uh, was plenty of both. In my opinion, history is determined by individual greatness, complemented by other individuals seeking the same goals to reach for greatness, and that drive often becomes obsession, flaws and all. Those visionaries do the best they can for their family and friends. Uh, they really do, and I truly believe that. After that, all they can do is hope for some understanding. As I said, rock and roll was not inevitable, and neither was civil rights. It was the obsession of great individuals that caused both of these revolutions to take place. And Alan Freed was one of those revolutionaries doing both simultaneously. As I've said many times in the past, 
He played black records for white kids and changed the world for the better. And our country crucified him for his accomplishments. But he sure got the last laugh. There's some evidence right down the street called the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. And evidence of far less importance, but evidence nonetheless would be me. <laughs> Personally, <laughs> personally, my life has been dedicated to chasing greatness, studying it, seeking it out, supporting it when I find it, and creating it when I can. Alan Freed was the first to set the standards we all aspire to. He's been one of my heroes and role models most of my adult life, good and bad. I've done 738 weekly radio shows and thanked him at the end of every one. I mostly made my living playing rock and roll, and I've never taken it for granted. I don't even take the existence of rock and roll for granted, especially now that rock and roll has returned to the cult it was when Alan found it in 1951. But Alan's taste and content was only half the story. There were probably a dozen white DJs playing R&B before him, but he's the one who sold it. And he did it all with a cowbell and a phone book. It was something new he introduced. It was called enthusiasm. And his enthusiasm was colorblind. Rock and roll will live on forever in some form or other, just like blues and jazz and gospel, bluegrass, and soul music. Our craft begins with live performance. So we don't need a music industry to survive. But we must acknowledge the rock era that Alan started is over. So this site will be a monument to both Alan and the rock era we lucky ones grew up in. There's a song, uh, Terry Cashman and Tom West wrote a song about Alan you may not be familiar with, called The King of Rock and Roll. As a song, uh, let's just say it has a lot of heart. <laughs> but it does have one great line. It's a shame the way we decided to say goodbye. It's a shame the way we decided to say goodbye. Well, today, at least partially fixes that. And now there will be a place where all of us and future generations can say goodbye and hello as Alan Freed inspires the next Moondogger to greatness. for Stevie Van Zandt. You know, this man travels all over the world, you know, with the first place in East Street Band. Next week he's going off to, to uh, Spain and be traveling all over and take time to come in here for the day to be able to share. We thank you so much, Stevie Van Zandt. This next gentleman was born in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Rock and roll teen idol who played local bands and was discovered by Ace Records while making a demo record at Kazuo Motasa's studio in New Orleans in 1958. Jimmy Clanton would record his debut single that year, Just a Dream, working with famous New Orleans studio musicians including Huey Piano Smith, Earl King on guitar, Lee Allen on tenor sax, and Hall of Famer drummer Earl Palmer. Jimmy would have other hits like Go Johnny Go, or Go Jimmy Go, other sleep, Another Sleepless Nights, and Venus in Blue Jeans, to name a few. But his biggest break came in 1958 when he starred in the Alan Freed movie, Go Johnny Go, playing the part of Johnny Melody. In that movie, he would turn out to be with a lot of Hall of Famers, future Hall of Famers. In that movie, he had Chuck Berry, Jackie Wilson, Richie Valens, Eddie Cochran, the Flamingos, and Harvey Fuqua of the Moonglows. Also in the movie were the Cadillacs, Joanne Campbell, and Sandy Stewart. Jimmy continues to perform today, has some special remembrances about his friend Alan Freed. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Jimmy Clanton. Well, hello. My remembrance of Alan Freed is extremely precious because overnight, uh, without me realizing it, 
I recorded a song that I wrote in 20 minutes. Wow. <laughs> Over a heartbroken experience with my first love. Everybody say, oh. oh. <laughs> and unbeknownst to me, the, the record overnight after appearances became a huge hit. And the agency that represented me uh, called me and said, uh, there's a fella that does a lot of big shows in New York and he wants you on there. His name is Alan Freed. Now you all have to remember, in 1958, I'm in a part of the world that New York was like Mars. I mean, there was no internet, there was no CNN, so I didn't know a lot about what was going on. But for whatever reason, with my corn pone, Louisiana accent, my little uh, rain, rainfall hairdo, my twang, and Alan, Alan and I fell in love with each other. We became uh, very personal friends. I was on all his shows. He would have me come in days before a big show just to hang out with him. And I want to tell one little poignant story to show you how he cared in ways that you would never imagine. I was in town staying in a hotel and this is a one-of-a-kind story to demonstrate how Alan Freed acted and how he thought. And I got a call about 10 o'clock this one night. He said, Jimmy, it's Alan. He said, get something on, get dressed. He said, I'm coming to pick you up. I'm taking you for a special, special situation. Well, I said, oh, okay. He picks me up, by the way, we got in the cab, and when they turn up the flag in 1958, it started at 20 cents. <laughs> do I go way back or do I go way back? We gave the cab driver, honest to God, a 10 cent tip. He was happy. Alan, so he picks me up and we go around to this area of town and we get out and we start walking up these steps beautiful outside building. Now remember, I'm from Louisiana. I'm from the Bayou country. I'd never been in an airplane before this. I'd never, never uh, uh, known anything about the outside world except New Orleans and Baton Rouge and everything. So we walk up these steps and I say, Alan, where in the world are we? He said, Jimmy, he said, this is a club. It's very well known. It's called the Copacabana. <laughs> well, oh, okay. So we go up and it's closed, but not quite closed. And we're standing at the bar, it was empty by now, and Alan was standing over here and I was looking at him. And Alan looked at me and he said, I'll never forget this, he said, Jimmy, there is a person that you named that you said you would have loved to have met him. Now, I was, had been with Alan so many times now over the year and the two years, that, you know, how would he remember anything like that? So he said, and he said, and Jimmy, I found out not only it was he in town, he's a personal friend of mine. And I would like for you to turn around and meet the man that you wanted to meet. And when I turned around, now I'm 5'11", and I turned around and with this great big smile, looking down at me was Nat King Cole. <laughs> And I was so in awe, I didn't even get his autograph, but we shook hands and he was so kind and so sweet. But Alan was that kind of guy. He, he did little things. He was conscientious of where I had come from and how I didn't know my way around the big city. And so those are my thoughts. And I'll admit, after, unbeknownst to me, when Just a Dream had become a big hit, he called the agency and said, I, I want this guy. And I think it was him that gave me that teen idol tag. I'm not sure. But uh, I'd like to give you just a little rendition of that very first song that represents the times of teenage love, uh, getting along with people, and the sock hops, and the Friday night football games, and of course, the big shows that Alan put on. 
And this was the song that he heard and brought me to New, to New York to, uh, to perform. Hold on. Okay. Just a dream. Just a dream. All our plans and all our schemes. How could I think you'd be mine? Those lives I tell myself each time. Remember those days? I know that we could never last. She just can't seem to end the past. Just a dream I dreamed in day. With her out on the living pain. But now I know it's too late for me. This is the sound from down in New Orleans Day. Give me a wave, everybody. <laughs> Now I know it's too late. Nah, it's never too late. Why folks like y'all around for me. in the audience, Rose Cayola is here. Rose, a very successful Broadway producer who is developing a musical based on the life of Alan Freed. They also, we have right there, then we have Larry Marshak and Gary Cupper for putting together the singers and songs of today's celebration. And Carolyn Travis right up front there, filmmaker and producer of the documentary Airplate. She's also having today's videotape for posterity. Thank you so much, Carolyn. It was a great doing that interview with you. You know, I feel so honored, all these great people having a chance to introduce so much of fabric of my life. And I have the honor of this next person is someone I met 16 years ago 
when this man was present as CEO of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum. I went into his office, we shook hands, and Terry Stewart told me how, when he was in college, I guess in Alabama, he used to listen to my show and won one of my record albums. And that's how, he said, how, how much he enjoyed listening to that album. I was amazed how Terry Stewart, formerly of the great state of Alabama, was so knowledgeable about all aspects of rock and roll, especially the early years. Terry was the longest serving leader for 14 years up until 2013. During his tenure, he turned this nonprofit museum into a solid institution and tourist draw that reportedly generated 100 million annually for the city of Cleveland. A man who has a great passion for rock and roll, especially the early years, my dear friend, ladies and gentlemen, Terry Stewart. I'd like to introduce the Honorable State Senator Denny Yuko, who has a proclamation to read from the state of Ohio. How are you? you know, normally you start, how, how are you going? Hey, hello, Cleveland! Yeah. But today, I'm going to say something different. Thank you, Cleveland! Thank you for showing up today. I'll tell you what, you know, I've had a wonderful opportunity to meet presidents, vice presidents, heads of foreign state, but to stand on the stage with Norman Knight. Wow. Wow. And to stand here and have the opportunity to pay recognition and honor to Alan Freed and everything he's done, everything he's meant. You know, in Columbus, often said, can you guys do anything right? Or they often say, you know, can you do something almost right? Or some people say you never do anything right. But one thing they will never disagree in that rock and roll is here to stay. Thank you, Alan Freed. Thank you for all that you do. As a member of the Ohio Senate, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I am pleased to recognize Mr. Alan Freed, the father of rock and roll, on this joyous celebration. Welcome home, my friend. Welcome home. And all of you, please don't be a stranger. Come and visit him as often as you want. Thank you, and God bless all of you. Let's hear it for State Senator Denny Hugo. The Drifters will once again perform a song that was a show tune written by composer Jerome Kern and lyricist Otto Harbach for their 1933 musical Roberta. The most well-known version was recorded in 1958 by the Platters for their album Remember When. The song went on to be a number one hit in January of 1959. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, here are the drifters with smoke it's in your eyes. Today. 
the Chief Executive Officer of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum is in the audience here. Jim Hankey, who is a noted rock journalist and former longtime curator for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Jim right there. Honorable Kent Smith of the Ohio House of Representatives representing Northeast Ohio. And now, the pride of Memphis, Tennessee is David Porter. American record producer, songwriter, singer, entrepreneur, and philanthropist in 2005 was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. In 2015, Rolling Stone magazine listed him among the 100 greatest songwriters of all time, writing songs for Sam and Dave like Soul Man, I Thank You, and Hold On, I'm Coming, for Mariah Carey with Dream Lover, Will Smith with Get Jiggy With It, and Carla Thomas with B-A-B-Y, Baby. He has written over 1,700 songs for a range of artists including Aretha Franklin, James Brown, Celine Dion, Otis Redding, Drake, ZZ Top, Tom Jones, Ted Nugent, Bonnie Raitt, Eminem, Patsy Cline, Albert King, and the Eurythmics. What a range. David is also chairman of the Consortium of for Memphis Music. The purpose of creating the CMM is to offer opportunities to young, talented artists and create a destination where there is an emphasis on songwriting and performance. He is rebranding Memphis as the city of soul music. Studios are provided free of charge, and Memphis will once again become a destination for young artists. A huge recording facility is under completion, and a major record company is moving to Memphis to provide further opportunities for the music world to be heard around the world. David had raised millions of dollars through this nonprofit foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, if you will, Mr. David Porter. Thank you very much. I am really, really honored to, to be here today uh, for several reasons, but the core of it is the fact that I wouldn't have had uh, some of the comments that Norm just made about me were it not for the fact of Alan Freed's commitment to being sure that quality, creativity in America would be exposed regardless of the color of some, one's skin. You know, it's interesting that uh, I ended up being a very, very close friend to Lance Free, Alan's son, and found over the years that though I did not know Alan personally, I, I, he had to be an unbelievably beautiful, beautiful person because Lance, his son, epitomizes that. He is someone that has done so much for the industry, so much for people. <laughs> Now, my brief comments are going to be uh, sentiments, I'm sure, of a few names I'll share with you. My brief comments are going to be the sentiments of people, some who are not no longer here with us, like Otis Redding, like my writing partner, Isaac Hayes, like Benny King, Albert King, B.B. King. So many of us who, who are passionate about music never would have had the exposure opportunity were it not for the commitment of Alan and his feeling for wanting to be sure that the creativity would be exposed in a, in a substantive kind of way by making a statement, by showing a commitment in the early 50s. I'm from a city called Memphis, Tennessee, and life was going on in a negative way between races in that time. But because of Alan's commitment to the exposure of the music, a guy with a company called Stax Records. Now, some of those songs, Soul Man and Hold On, I'm Coming, you may be surprised to know 
that the musicians on those records were two black guys and two white guys on all of them. From the hits on Otis Redding to Sam and Dave to Carla Thomas to Albert King, the list goes on and on. So the climate had to be made right because of the energy and the commitment that Alan had for being sure that the proper exposure for the music would be afforded to all citizens, regardless of the color of their skin. And he's right, uh, I've had an, an unbelievable, wonderful career, but it would not have happened without a door opener. And I consider Alan Free a door opener for America's credibility, of music credibility all over the world. We have a longtime radio man, Jack Gratian and Ed Sparks from ITM Worldwide. Gary Wenner and Ray King Gasser of Rock Icon Radio Station, WXIA, WXIY, or Wixie here in Cleveland for their kind care of Alan Free's legacy and their dedicated promotion of this event. And also we mentioned Kathy Goss, but also Karen Drake of Lakeview Cemetery for their tireless efforts to bring Alan to his final resting place here at Lakeview Cemetery. Now we've been talking about Alan Freed and we have members of the Freed family in the audience. So first of all, I would like to bring up Siggy who is uh, Alan's daughter, youngest daughter, and I understand she's a doctor of research ophthalmology in Denver, and uh, she loved to be able to watch her dad make spaghetti sauce and also ice cream sundaes. And you might want to share some personal things, Siggy, about your dad when you were a youngster growing up. Siggy. So I have a bigger teleprompter than Stevie. <laughs> so I just wanted to thank everybody who worked to make this day a reality, especially Lance, my brother, who has worked really hard to ensure a fantastic final resting place for Dad. Thank you, Lance. I love you. My dad was 43 years old when he died 51 years ago. Next week, I will celebrate my 62nd birthday. I always wonder how much more dad would have been able to accomplish had he lived a long and healthy life. He never saw us grow up or live long and happy lives. And yes, he was flawed, but aren't we all? Dad, you were amazing. You passed on your musical talent to me, and for that, I will always be grateful. Music has a way of changing people's lives and making this world brighter and instilling childlike joy into our hearts. Rock and roll will always keep us young. My dad knew what he wanted to do with his life pretty early on, and he knew that the challenges along the way would seriously test his resolve. He wanted to inspire a whole generation of kids, and he did that and much more. They listened to his radio shows at night under their blankets with transistor radios pressed up against their ears so that their parents wouldn't catch them staying up late on a school night listening to the big beat of rock and roll. Throughout my life, I have come into contact with many of these kids who grew up to prosper in all walks of life. When they got to know me better and they learned who my dad was, they told me without exception that Alan Freed made a huge difference in their lives. They said that he gave them the freedom to embrace change, to be fearless, and to have rock and roll accompany milestones along the way. My brother Lance and I reconnected a few years ago and have had many great times together talking about Dad and how he influenced our lives. 
like stories of dad making fantastic chili con carne and us kids waiting eagerly for the chili to be served. And our house was always filled with music, from soaring Wagnerian operas, to the tight harmonies of the drifters, to the haunting beauty of singers like Nat King Cole. Dad gave his kids the drive to be the very best we could be. The short time he had on earth was filled with incredible creativity and he managed to touch the lives of a generation of kids in a very special and unforgettable way. In 1965, when my dad was being taken to the hospital on a stretcher from our house in Palm Springs, he held my hand tightly, looked into my eyes and said very quietly, don't let anyone tell you that you can't do something. You can do anything you set your mind to. I have carried that advice with me and have held it close to my heart. It has propelled me to great professional success in medicine and a continuing love for everything rock and roll. <laughs> rock on, Dad. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful scene. Now, two months ago, I received a phone call from Lance Freed and asking me if I'd be honored to be able to be the MC of this event. I said, hands down, absolutely, Lance, absolutely. And I thought, all the work that's have to go into this, monumental task, because Lance lives in Los Angeles. And we introduced Lance to a couple of people, of course, Jim Davison and Chris Mitchell, Ron Watt, and they put this thing together, help with Lance. And the event you see today, Lance worked diligently, phone calls, coming back and forth, everything else to do this because he wanted to do this for his father because it meant so much. Getting inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1986 was a wonderful, wonderful gesture. But the true fulfillment was to be able to have his father, as they say, the father of rock and roll come home to where it all began. And what a beautiful place, the Lakeview Cemetery. So I'd like to be able to bring on the man responsible for putting this whole thing together and working diligently to honor his father, if you will, ladies and gentlemen, Lance Free. I was sitting in the back so that I could hear a lot of applause for a long time. Thank you, Norm. Singing. I, uh, um... But after his passing in 1965, he continued to be on the road. Um, his cremated remains um, traveled from California to New York and then to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And for 51 years, he moved around. So, Dad, uh, what I want to say to you is uh, welcome home. The I want to take a quick moment to share a couple of personal stories with you. One lucid memory that I have was on Sunday afternoons at the house in Connecticut. He would bring home all the 45s um, that he had received during the week, and Alana, my sister, and I would open those 45s and stack them up. Um, and my dad would come into the room, and sometimes there were as many as 80 singles, and he'd put each one of them on the record player and listen to six, eight, twelve bars of each one, sometimes more. Most of them he'd fling across the room like a frisbee. <laughs> um, every once in a while, one went into the maybe pile, and I remember one particular record by a Connecticut group called the Five Satins. <laughs> After he finished playing that record, he said, this one's going on the radio tomorrow. And it was called In the Still of the Night. Um, he had a terrific ear for music. Maybe it was because he had double mastoiditis and had been drafted into the army and, and ended up in the ski patrol by accident, which is true. <laughs> he didn't know how to ski. He was from Salem. <laughs> you don't ski in Salem. 
Another memory that stands out quickly is, is at one of his shows at the New York Paramount Theater. Um, his dressing room was four stories up, and you could look out the window, and down below there were a couple of hundred teenagers, and they were all yelling, get your dad, get your dad. So I said, hey, everybody wants you to come to the window. So he came over to the window, and he waved. And, and it wasn't like he was waved, like he was a star. It was like he was... They, they wanted him to come down and be part of them. They were, he was their biggest fan. They were his biggest fans. He, uh, he wasn't a star. He, he just was like everybody else. He just never grew up. He was a teenager, just like all the kids down there. And I think that was part of the magic. And finally, I want to mention that I used to have an opportunity to watch him broadcast occasionally on Friday nights on WINS in New York and I think I was eight years old so for me to sit through almost four hours of a show without fidgeting and wanting to leave was something because as kids you know we it's hard to keep our attention but he was so good at what he did he, he was almost like he was reaching through this microphone and touching people personally and uh, Eisenhower was going on the air, President Eisenhower, he was going to address the nation. So there was a one hour reprise, in other words, Eisenhower is going to broadcast, so we all ran across the street to grab something to eat at a restaurant. And we arrived knowing that we had to order rather quickly, which we did, and uh, about the time the food arrived, this guy comes over and he stands next to my father and he says, Hi, Alan. And my dad looked up at him, and he looked back down at his plate, and he said, you know, I'll never play your records. And I thought, God, he's, how rude, you know? Um, and later on, I was told that this guy was Pat Boone. <laughs> I think that... Um, it's true, you know? I mean, he, he wouldn't play Pat Boone's version of Tutti Frutti, which is a piece of crap. He played Little Richard. Rob Reiner and Stephen King. So ladies and gentlemen, if you will, the Drifters with Stand By Me. together with us. Come on. When the night has come and the land is dark and the moon is the only light we'll see. No, I won't be afraid won't be afraid just as long as you stand stand by me so dark Yeah. 
it down for me. Here we go. We want to honor, we're first of all honored to be here with you on today and we want to honor not only the Freed family, we want to say thank you for allowing us to be here, but we also want to pay tribute to another inductee of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the 1986 induction with Mr. Alan Freed. I'm sure you will know this song. Want everyone to grab along, grab your neighbor and sing along with us. the monument for this very special unveiling. This is going to be something that people from all over the world guaranteed will be coming to Cleveland to see because this is a very, very special thing for the father of rock and roll. When they come to visit the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I guarantee you they will all be here in Cleveland to look at this wonderful, wonderful thing. And you being part of it today is very special. So Lance and family, if you will, the unveiling. Karen, thank you for, um, where are you? I'm here, Liz. Oh, <laughs> thanks for uh, putting this up. You're very welcome. Um, it's an honor. And the, I don't know whether the artist is here. It took him hundreds of hours. Pete, Pete, you're here. God bless you for doing this. Everybody pull in this Velcro, okay? Wow. Oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> like you're wow. taking your pants off. I did want to come off of it. On the other side, there's a jukebox, actually. What a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful <laughs> monument. You can put your, How about the free uh, family standing quote? Yeah, yeah, Grip shot. <laughs> Lance, get closer. We need, we need pictures <laughs> of the family. Okay, get together. I mean, get as close as you can. <laughs> okay, you don't got to Okay. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank all the people that were here to participate in this, especially the Free Family. Thank you, Lance, and everyone, and all the people that helped make this possible. And our featured guests and the speakers, little Stephen and Kerry Stewart and David Porter and Jimmy Clanton and all the people that came on board to be able to be part of this. We're going to close now. In November of 1956, Jesse Belvin recorded a song called Good Night, My Love. And by the way, the pianist on the recording was a 12-year-old named Barry White, who would go on to become a major star in the 1970s, child prodigy. Alan Freed loved the song, would close his shows with that song. So for the memory of the father of rock and roll, we thank you all that were here and close with the words of the late, great Alan Freed. Thank you. Before we leave uh, tonight, we'd like to say a uh, special thanks. We don't have much time to thank everybody, but especially to our friends in the music business and to our wonderful friends here and all of you out there for your great loyalty. This is not goodbye, it's just good night, and we'll see you soon. Good night, my love.